You're listening to the Light for Living podcast, featuring the sermons of Emmanuel Baptist Church in El Dorado, Arkansas, where Dr. Clark Whitney serves as senior pastor. Join us for verse-by-verse messages through the life-changing Word of God. Along the way, we'll also feature devotional thoughts, Bible studies, and interviews, all designed to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this extraordinary privilege and honor to be here, and I take seriously wherever I go uh, and whatever I do. I believe God has given me a great privilege to be able to preach and a tremendous responsibility wherever I go. And I just want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Baylor Clark Whitney. That is the coolest name. Uh, And uh, for letting me come and uh, really appreciate you. We prayed for you and Aaron and may the Lord be with you. And I want to thank the church, Gina and I do, for loving, for loving this pastor and his family. You know, there's something special about the relationship between a pastor and a people. I can come in here today and I can hopefully minister the Word of God uh, to you and encourage you and help you, hopefully inspire you to be what God wants you to be. But I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing like it when you are the man of God that God has called to the church and you open the book of God to the people of God and you see the work of God. And I miss every day uh, that relationship between pastor and people. So Clark, in one word of counsel to you, don't ever take it for granted. And church, a counsel to you, don't ever take that dude for granted, all right? And uh, do your best to love him and encourage him. Pray for him and let him know you pray for him. That's really important. And uh, that's what pastors really need more than anything in the world in this day. Now, Gene and I, we've been married a few years. Um, in fact, we've been married a lot of years. Um, and uh, the moment she proposed to me, it changed my life. And... Uh, with that, we've had, uh, we have two sons. We have a son who is the head football coach of a large public high school in Birmingham, Alabama area. And uh, they have, he and Kate, they have three sons. And then Nick, who succeeded me five years ago. And, um, and he and Meredith, they have four children. They have the three girls and one boy. And so we're grateful to God for our seven grandchildren and uh, for that and for the work of the Lord in people's lives. Now today I come to you with a burden uh, that I want to share with you. In fact, uh, this burden is real because I believe it was and is a biblical burden. I believe it is one that was on Jesus' heart. And quite honestly, it is absolutely one are the most critical issues in American life today. I want to speak to you on the subject of anxiety. Anxiety. The word can be translated anxiety or anxious, or it can be translated as worry, depending on the translation that you read from the Word of God. The passage is one that is extremely familiar to you. Some of you could quote part of this passage. It's not like I am coming in here today and preaching something that, you know, you've never heard before or that you have never been exposed to before. If I were to stand up and preach out of the book of Obadiah, most of you have probably never heard a message on the book of Obadiah. Okay, that's a Bible book, by the way. It's over in the Old Testament. It's in the white pages of your Bible. And then... You know, you need to understand, but it doesn't matter because God's truth is God's truth. And what God says and what God, the Bible says, God says. And we need to understand what he says about all things, whatever they may be. And today I'm going to ask you, if you would, I want you to look in your Bible with me. If you have a copy of it in the printed edition or you have it on an e-device, please scroll that up if you have it memorized 
Here it is. It's Matthew chapter number 6, and I want to read beginning in verse 25 uh, through the end of the chapter. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, would you please stand with me in honor of the Word of God? And I'm going to be reading uh, from the New American Standard Translation, and you will see it on the screen here today. These are the words of Jesus. So let's remind ourselves you have Jesus telling you how to live your life today. You have Jesus telling you what he thinks about something and what he thinks about you. And so let's remember this is his love given to us. Are you ready? Let's read the Word of God. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. As to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on, or for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. If they do not sow nor reap nor gather crops in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them, are you not? much more important than they. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single day to his life's span? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? What a powerful word. Do not worry, then saying, what are we to eat? What are we to drink? Or what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Father, we have just read the word of the living God. Would you please make it live in our lives today in a way like we have never looked at it before, thought about it before, and may the word just be the word today. This is God's word, the infallible word, the truthful word. The word that has absolutely no error at all. And whether someone is watching online today or whether someone is in this building with us, we pray for the moving of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. And we ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Johns Hopkins Medicine estimates that some 26% of all adults 18 years and older have a diagnosable mental disorder. These may be anxiety disorders, they say as well as matters such as depression, addiction, substance abuse, and many more. Now, the entire mental health awareness repeatedly is telling us here in the United States, and I'm sure it's truth around the world, it is telling us that the mental health crisis in America 
is deeply concerning for adults, but as much as well for children and teenagers. Now, years ago, decades ago, even Dr. Charles W. Mayo of the famous Mayo Clinic said, and I quote, Worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system, and profoundly affects health. I have never known a man who died from overwork, but many who died of worry. You know, when you look in the Bible and you read this word anxiety or worry, when you look at it in a Greek New Testament, the word that is mentioned there is what we would call a compound word. Now, a compound word, even in our language, is what? It is the compounding of two words made into one, okay? Now, I want you to notice something here today because I want to break this down for you because to me, it is something that is usually completely ignored when somebody preaches on this subject. The first Greek word is the word merizo. It means to divide. And the second word is the word noose. And it means the mind. So I want you to listen very carefully to me. Anytime you worry or anytime you have anxiety and get anxious in your life, you are dividing the mind. That's what Jesus said. Of all the words that Jesus said, he talked about that. That word is only used 17 times in the New Testament. And interesting, in the 10 verses I read a moment ago, that word is used six of those 17 times. The next time you have somebody tell you that the Bible is no longer relevant, you need to say, really? You really believe what you're saying? And they're going to say, yes, I really believe what I'm saying. Well, then why does Jesus literally speak in the greatest sermon ever preached, ever written, called the Sermon on the Mount, and he speaks about one of the top issues in American life today over 2,000 years ago. Now, folks, that's pretty phenomenal when you think about it. So don't you ever think the Bible is irrelevant and it has no place because it does. You see, any time in your life, you are thinking and pondering about today's challenges and simultaneously worrying about tomorrow's problems, you drain your energy. Have you ever noticed that? It wears you out. It just wears you out. Well, you know why that wears you out? Because you're dividing your mind. Part of you is here and part of you is there. Just like Jesus said. You know, in recent days, it was a few weeks ago, I just really felt led deeply to go into this passage on my own and act like I had never preached it, never taught it, never read it, and just say, okay, what is God saying? There's something here that Jesus wanted us to get. And so I cleared the decks. And folks, I could have stood up and preached this without one lick of study, okay? But I decided, you know what? There's something here Jesus wants us to hear. And it's only because I've already done it so many times. But I'm not doing it anymore like I used to do it. Because God gave me great insight just a few weeks ago about this. And it's because I took a deep, deep dive in the text to let the text be the text. Listen, for all of you that are Bible teachers in here, remember this. 
Let the Bible be the Bible. Let what God says, let it be said. And the point of the text should be the point of your lesson or the point of your message. You understand? So that's what we're going to do today. We're just going to let the Bible be the Bible, and I want to show you what Jesus says. So I want to go deeper even in this whole word of anxiety, being anxious, or worried. Let me share with you a few things. For example, that word means to be drawn into different directions. To draw into different directions. Some of you, when you were children or teenagers, most adults don't do this anymore because we think we're too cool. But, you know, you used to play tug-of-war. You remember tug-of-war game? All right. You're being drawn in different directions, and whoever can bring their group over, they win. You got it? All right. Let me give you a word picture never to forget. Worry and anxiety is like you being drawn into different directions. And let me give you the word picture. We tug a war, there's a rope. With you, you are the rope. You're the one being pulled in different directions. The dividing of the mind. And also to distract you. That's what anxiety does. It distracts you. It also distracts the heart. From the true object of life. I mean, if God, if God has a purpose for us, when we are so caught up in the moment and in the worry and the fret and the and the anxiety of all that, then we're going to miss God's purpose. We're going to miss what the Lord wills for us to do that day because we are totally being, you know, run by the moment, which is so easy to occur in all of our lives. But it also means to be swayed by care, mainly concern for ourselves is what it means. We're drawn by ourselves, ourselves alone, and we become so concerned for ourselves, what do we do? We're striving after all these things, all these things Jesus talked about, your body, what you wear, what you're going to eat, what you're going to do. And they draw you aside again and again and again. So when you become anxious or you become worried, there is a high price that we pay when we do this. And here's the price tag. It is a price to pay mentally and physically and spiritually and emotionally and relationally. That's why anxiety can literally take it out of your life and make you not what God wants you to be. In the 1800s, there was a man, some of you may have read before about him. His name was George Mueller. Mueller had a remarkable life. He lived the, almost the entire 18th uh, series there. Quite a, quite a remarkable man. Mueller cared for over 10,000 orphans. Wow. In the 1800s. He was known to be a man of prayer and faith and compassion. But not only did he care for over 10,000 orphans, he also established 117 schools that educated over 120,000 children children in Christian education. Now, why do I mention Mueller? Because Mueller was known to be a great man of faith. Listen to what he said and wrote in his journal. And I quote, The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. 
And the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. In other words, the beginning, the moment you start to worry, faith goes out the door. Did you hear me? And yet, the moment you exhibit faith, because faith has an object, and the object is who? Jesus Christ. The object is God himself, what God says. And the moment you operate in faith, then you settle down, right? And you feel, okay, God's got this. I'm going to make it. And God's going to see me through. Well, Robert H. Mouts, his commentary on Matthew is quite a rebuke about this text. He writes, and I quote, Worry is practical atheism, and it's an affront to God. He said that's what Jesus was saying in the passage. It's like practical atheism. Anytime we try to take it into our own hands, it's like us not even believing God. It's like us believing that God is dead or God is vacant or God is not involved in the affairs of life. But one thing you learn when you read this passage, Jesus said, I'm telling you folks, and don't ever forget this, Jesus is involved in the affairs of your life. And he cares for you. I want us to let the Bible be the Bible for a moment. I want to share with you three basic things today. And the first is I want us to look at the scripture about the declarations of Jesus in this passage. What did Jesus declare? What did Jesus believe? What were the realities that Jesus laid out before us? In other words, listen, the facts. That's what Jesus gave us. He gave us the facts. Because what God says, God means. Because God is faithful. God does not change. He changes people, but he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Correct? So with this, what did Jesus say? Now, I'm not going to put these, ten, these declarations on the screen for you because some of you would wear yourself out trying to get them done. But I am going to encourage you to look at your Bible. And if you have a Bible and you have a pen and you want to mark that or you want to highlight it, you can do it real quickly. But this is what I want you to see this with me. This is Jesus speaking to you personally. For example, look at verse 25. He says, Clark, do not be worried about your life. He didn't really say Clark. He said your name too, and even mine. Look at what Jesus said in verse 26. Look at the birds of the sky. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Wow. Look at verse 30. You of little faith. Look at verse 31. Do not worry then. This is Jesus talking to you. Look at verse 32. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Wow. Did y'all hear what I just said? Come on. So, I mean, y'all give me a like a hello pastor or something. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Verse 33, it's the sixth one. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Verse 33 is number seven. All these things will be provided to you. Number eight, do not worry about tomorrow. Verse 34. Verse 34 gives number nine also. Tomorrow will worry about itself. And then this profound word in verse 34 gives us the 10th declaration. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, folks, listen. 
These are the factual statements of Jesus. So take them that way. It's like law. They're just realities. And this was the reality of what Jesus was speaking to you and speaking to me. But then let's look at the questions of Jesus. The questions of Jesus. Now, some of you are Bible teachers, but I'm telling you, nobody taught better than Jesus. And Jesus was the master teacher. And when you look at his teaching, he would do what I just did with you. He would state facts and realities and statements and declarations. But then he would penetrate the crowd asking them a question. He would personalize it with the question. So I want to point out a few questions Jesus is asking. And we're going to do the very same thing we just did. And there are eight of them that I'm going to bring to your attention. Number one, is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? That's a good question to ask. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? That's a yes or a no. What y'all think? Huh? You don't vote? Number two question is, are you not worth much more, excuse me, are you not much more important than they? That's what Jesus asked. It's over in number, verse number 26 when he was referring to the way God is taking care of the birds and God is feeding the birds. And then Jesus says, now now that you look at those birds and you see what I'm doing with them, are you not much more important than they? So, why are you worried, Jesus said. The third is, which of you, by worrying, can add a single day to his lifespan? That's a deep question. Are any of y'all going to live longer because you worry? That's what Jesus is saying. You're not going to add anything to your life. If you've added your life by worry, I mean, some of y'all live to 5,000 years old. Number four, why are you worried about clothing? Verse 28. That's, that, that, that right there, I wouldn't advise Next time your wife is talking about perhaps buying something of clothing, you say, well, you know, honey, Jesus said, why are you worried about clothing? I probably wouldn't, I probably wouldn't go there like that. <laughs> Just a thought. Look at number five. If God so clothes the grass of the field, will he not much more clothe you? Man, what a powerful statement. Look at verse 31, number 6. What are we to eat? I mean, you realize what the first question would be when some of your families get in the car, don't you? What are we going to eat today? Where are we going? <laughs> Anybody ever heard of, you know, not going and eating at home? Not much these days, right? It's a little different. What are we to eat? And then what are we to drink? That's what Jesus said in verse 31. And then what are we to wear the clothing? For clothing, verse 31. All those questions were asked by Jesus here in the text. So let's bring it to closure. I want to talk about, well, let me, let me read. I want to go back and I want to look at verse 31 and 32 because I want you to see how he put this together. He said, verse 31, do not worry then, saying, what are we to eat, what are we to drink, and what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, those that don't know, that do not follow God, they eagerly seek after all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Wow, what a word. So let's talk about the recommendations of Jesus to overcome anxiety or worry. 
What are the recommendations of Jesus? What would he say? What does this passage teach us about this? I'm going to just highlight three of those real quickly. Recommendation number one, Jesus said, if you want to overcome worry and, and, and deal with it in your life day by day, how, how, do you, how, how does that happen? I think what Jesus is saying to us is this, Jesus first in your life. Jesus first in your life. But seek ye first. That's what Jesus said. His kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, you seek him and you live like him and you be like him and you think like him. And Jesus is trying to move his people to think like him, like kingdom people. So Jesus first in your life, rather than all the things Jesus talked about, no matter whether it's food or drink or clothing or other matters. In other words, God wants you to understand the most important thing you can do to, to overcome these things of worry and anxiety is to seek Jesus first every day of your life. He wants to be first. Period. That's what he wants. And he's the secret to that. When I was a young boy preacher, I got to know and spent some time. In fact, I spoke on some of his conferences with him. A man by the name of Bill Bright. Bill Bright was a major leader in Christianity for decades. Bill Bright was a layman. God put the university campuses of America on his heart. He started what was called Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now Crew. Well, he would teach again and again about the importance of Jesus being first in your life and Jesus being the center of your life. Now, I want to just quickly tell you what he would say to you if, you, if he were here with you today. He would say, he said, listen, now there are basically three kinds of people in this room today. And he would say, I'm going to describe your life by a circle, a circle. And in every one of our circles in our lives, there is a throne, a throne. Now, we don't think a lot like thrones, but you follow what I'm saying? A throne. And he said the real defining thing about each one of these three kinds of people is relating to that throne. In fact, he would address the first people saying, in your life, you're on the throne. You, you, you are ruling and reigning your life. You're in charge of your life. And when I look for Jesus in your life, you're, Jesus is not in your life. He's way over here. You barely pay him any attention at all. And maybe not even recognize him. But that's the first kind of person here today. There are people in this room today. Jesus is not in your life. You run your life. You are on the throne of your life. You are in control of your life. You are determining your life. I want to tell you that is not God's will for your life. God wants you to put Christ first in your life and receive Christ in your life today. The second kind of person would be the person who, who is still on the throne of their life. But if you, there's a, somebody else I notice in the circle, and that is Jesus. He is, he is at least in your life. The problem is, he's over here looking at your life, and you're still on the throne. You know what Paul would call that, don't you? The Apostle Paul? He would call that a carnal Christian over in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians 3. That's what he would call it. And there are many of us here today. That's exactly what we are Many days of our lives, we, we run our lives. Jesus is in our life. We know when we met Christ. We can tell you about when we met Christ, and that's important. And But you know what? 
we're, we're not letting him run it. In other words, he's not being given the authority in our life to be the Lord of our life, the quarterback of our life. And then he would say there's a third person here today, and that third person is a person where Jesus Christ is on the throne of your life. And it's your life, and you're in it, but you're not in charge of it, and you know it. So I ask you today, I wonder how many of you today, Christ is not in your life, way out there. You know who he is, you, you've heard about him, you, you know a little bit about it, or maybe you don't have a clue. Well, I want to tell you today, you need to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And how many of you are like that? I hope you'll come today and receive Christ. I wonder how many of us today need to really get our act together relating to this whole anxiety and worry thing when we understand there's not a shot we have if we're running our own lives. We don't have a shot. we got to yield to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We need Him on the throne of our life, not ourselves. Seek Jesus first in your life. There's a second recommendation I believe Jesus would give us. Believe in God's providential care. Believe in God's providential care. That's very, very important. Because when you look at this, that means that God is involved in your life. Do you all believe God is involved in your life? He is sovereign. I believe God's involved in... America. I believe he's involved in every country of the world. I believe he's involved in the world. I believe he's involved in your life and my life, and he really cares for us. But because we believe this, we are convinced that God does provide and does care for us. We may not understand everything that ever happens in our lives. That doesn't mean we have all the answers in our lives. That doesn't, that's not what that means. But one thing I know is that God really does care for me. Do you all know that today? And when everybody else walks out, he walks in. And he's always there today and forever. So I need to seek Jesus first in my life. In January, excuse me, in June, in this past June, about three or four months ago, we released a, a new book that the Lord gave me called Day by Day and Night by Night. It's a 365-day devotional book for people like you and people like me. You know, I learned a lot since then about talking to people about it who have been doing it, businessmen, teenagers, college students, people out here in real life, people like me that supplement it every day. But one of the things that I've learned in all this is that, you know, people need God's voice in their life. And one of the greatest ways they can create consistency in their life is to have a devotional book somewhat like this. And many of you have done this for years. I mean, I've, I've read through the Bible every year for probably 30 plus years. All right? At least once. And start it all over again later, before the year's out. So I'm a big Word of God guy. But I still read Oswald Chambers. My utmost for his highest every day. And now read mine in case somebody asks me about what you mean here. Okay? So my point is, is that, you know, if you're looking for something that gets you at least consistent in putting Jesus first, that's what a devotional can do for you. Some of you live fast. You think you don't have any time more than for that. Well, look, hey, three to five minutes is a great place to begin consistency. You can get it at 
Anywhere you buy books, you can order it. You can get it in 24 hours and just start the day you get it. But I want you to notice we have to put Jesus first, believe in God's providential care, and I want you to hear this third one because this one is key. Give your worries to God. Give your worries to God. You see, when you live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it is a daily experience that you give your worries to God. The only way you're ever going to be free from anxiety or free from worry is that you will release those worries day by day and night by night. You're releasing them to God every day. Why do you give them to Him? Because He's sufficient. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. Do you believe that today? Either He does or He doesn't. Either that is a truth or that is a lie. Which one is it? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That's why I am a big, big, big believer on having a prayer list in your life, keeping that prayer list up to date in your life, because I'm telling you, that's how you give your worries to God every day. That's it. You remind yourself of what's on your heart and you talk to God about them, and you leave them in God's hands. So give your worries to God. Give your requests. Give your concerns. In other words, if you don't give them to Him, you're going to carry them, and therefore you will live worried because you are dividing your mind. Are you with me, folks? There is a better way. I think that's what Jesus is really telling us. You can live this way, but I got a better way. You put me first in your life. You trust my care in your life. If I can take care of the birds, dude, you're nothing. I mean, y'all, y'all think about that. If you're out driving today or walking or running or doing something, you think about all the birds and you watch them fly here, go there. And just think to yourself, you know what? Jesus takes care of every one of them. That's what he said. Again, either he does or he doesn't. Does he? And if he can do that, how much more can I take care of you? Oh, you of little faith. But I tell you what, this verse here, I'm about to lay out here. When you think about anxiety and you think about worry, this is like Jesus giving a drop-the-mic moment. And it's a verse that many of you have heard many, many times. John 14, 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Boop. That's what Jesus said. Is Jesus on the throne of your life? Is he in your life? If you have never ever given your life to Christ, give your life to Christ today. You may not remember the day or the hour that you gave your life to Christ, but I'll tell you one thing, you can know you're saved, and you can know, you can know that you know that you know. You'll never forget the place you gave your life to Christ. What was your place where you gave your life to Christ? You'll never forget it. If you did it, but if you haven't done it, make this your place to give your life to Christ. If you want to come 
today to give your life to Jesus, I hope that you will come and share that with some of our staff team that will be here at the front. If you're here today and you're visiting this church and you're searching for a church home, I'm telling you, come and be a part of this fellowship. If you have a prayer need today, come and let these folks pray for you. Or maybe some of you just said, man, I just need to give my own worries to God. I don't want to tell anybody. You don't need to tell anybody. Tell Jesus. Then listen, come here today and just kneel here at the front or just come and stand and just give it to Jesus today. And if there's someone here today that God is calling into the ministry of missions or, or into ministry, I hope you will give that worry to God and come and let us pray for you today. Whatever the need, you come. Will you do it? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior today, you want to go to heaven when you die, whether you're watching online or whether you're in this room with me today, would you just pray this, meaning this in your heart today? And we believe, we believe Jesus will come in your life. Say to him right now, whisper it in your heart. Just say, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I turn from my sins today. And I open my heart. Would you please come and take away my sin and come to live within my heart? By faith, I receive Christ right now in my life. And I give you, Jesus, first in my life. My friend, if you prayed that with us or you wished you had of, I hope that you will come in just a moment. Along with all the others who might want to come to pray about something, to talk to God about something in your life, don't wait, don't hesitate. We're going to stand, and as we stand right now and we begin to sing, you make your way and come right now. Would you join me as we stand together and you come? Thank you for joining us today. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with a friend. We hope you'll tune back in next time to the Light for Living podcast.